Good morning. Okay, I'm gonna get started um, and welcome you. Good morning, good morning, everybody. So let me be the first to welcome you to this first webinar for 2024, whether you're joining us from the United States, the Caribbean, Europe, Brazil, South Africa, India, wherever you are, the Middle East, anywhere from around the world, welcome. And let me offer you a hearty Caribbean welcome from the University of the West Indies, Cave Hill Campus, Barbados, where we at the Sridhar Ramphal Center for International Trade, Law, Policy and Services, the SRC, is based. The topic today is globally relevant, perhaps among the most talked about trade policy issues in recent years, not only because of the level of its ambition and potential impact on global trade, but also because it aligns the trade system very closely with that of the climate system in the context of attainment of one of the most important sustainable development goals. It is very much about how countries take action to achieve climate ambitions using domestic trade instruments that have global impact and some intended and unintended consequences. So just to reassure you that you are actually in the right place, we are talking today about the EU's carbon border adjustment mechanism or the CBAM with a focus today on responses from the global south. And that's a packed term, I know, but it's used here to distinguish those countries from the developed countries. The focus is on their responses to the EU CBAM, assessing it from the perspective of its legality, effectiveness, and practical implications. And it's really a first step in what I hope is more of a collective conversation about how the global South should and can respond to it. So just very briefly, the European Union defines its CBAM as a tool to price the carbon emitted during the production of carbon intensive goods entering the EU and encourage cleaner industrial production in non-EU countries. Proposed by the European Commission as part of the European Green Deal in 2019, one of its main objectives is to place European companies which pay for their carbon emissions linked to their production on an equal footing with non-EU importers, with a tax on EU importers corresponding to the difference between the EU carbon price and the carbon price in the country of origin, if there is one, the EU hopes to avoid what it calls carbon leakaging or carbon leakage as companies move their production to countries with less stringent carbon policies. The CBAM entered into application in its transitional phase in October, 2023, and in its initial scope applies to imports of goods such as cement, iron, steel, aluminum, fertilizers, and electricity whose production is carbon intensive. That transitional phase is in place through to the 31st of December, 2025, during which importers are required to submit quarterly reports on embedded emissions in certain goods imported during the first quarter year that the CBAM is being applied. From 2026 onward, the purchase of CBAM certificates reflecting the carbon cost will be required. So what have we been able to glean from the responses globally to this EU CBAM so far? And here we've noticed there's been quite a variety of responses. First of all, from the legal perspective, whether it is consistent with trade rules, uh, in particular discriminatory rules against discrimination. And there have even been soundings of possible cases that could be brought against the EU before the WTO. At the level of effectiveness, 
and impact on competitiveness. Some studies, including by UNCTAD, the World Bank, and the London School of Economics and Political Science and Africa Climate Foundation, estimate that there may be disproportionate impacts on certain major economies and exports, including from Africa, um, in some of these sectors to which it will apply. In terms of fairness, many have called for the CBAM to be redesigned to consider different developmental levels in line with the principle of common but differentiated responsibility, noting the absence of exemptions for least developed countries, small island developing states, those countries that make negligible contributions to GHG emissions. And some have also asked that the rebates collected from border adjustment should actually be returned to developing countries and not kept in the EU itself. So many of these reactions we already know. The question that this webinar is going to raise and hopefully debate and discuss is what are the tangible responses being taken and should be taken by developing countries to manage the tensions that the CBAM has already raised relating to competitiveness, access to an important market, and balancing that against their own climate and developmental needs. There have been already some discussions mooted at the academic level, including the VILAR framework, which I am part of, considering the establishment of a sustainability fund where some of the rebates can be distributed on the basis of criteria to be developed and impartially by a third party like the WTO. In my own region, the University of Guyana Green Institute, um, Dr. Thomas Singh has suggested the implementation of a tax on the carbon content of oil and gas produced in the region in Guyana, Suriname and Trinidad and Tobago called an upstream carbon tax at the wellhead, which would help with mitigation and raise the cost of using gas and also provide revenues that can finance adaptation. You'll hear more about some of that hopefully in the discussion that ensues. But today, I am so privileged to be able to draw on a global network of international trade and economic experts to think through some of these issues and how developing countries will and should respond to this EU CBAM in light of their own climate challenges and developmental needs. The webinar will proceed as follows. I will introduce my speakers and then ask each of them to present their perspective, whether arising from their own country experience or a more global view of where they think developing countries should go. They will each be given seven to 10 minutes to speak. We'll open the floor to a discussion among them and then to you, the audience, who during the course of their discussion should feel free to write your questions in the Q&A segment uh, of, the, uh, of the platform. Let me start with the introduction of the panel panelists in the order in which I've asked them to speak. Atul Sharma is the co-founder of an Indian law firm, Servada Legal, and specializes in international trade and customs law. He has assisted governments, government agencies, and private clients in the areas of WTO trade law policy and FTA negotiations the environment, customs issues, regulatory law, and he has had experience in WTO litigation. In fact, I met Atul during his time in Geneva. Next, another friend from Geneva is Mustakim Dagama, who is an international trade consultant who has worked in the Department of Trade and Industry in South Africa and headed the Legal International Trade and Investment Directorate He's previously been South Africa's representative to, representative to UNCTAD and UNCTAD, 
and during his work in the South African mission in Geneva was instrumental in passing the June 2022 TRIPS decision on vaccines in respect of COVID-19. Colette van der Ven, another friend from Geneva and former work colleague, is an international lawyer with expertise in trade and sustainable development. As founder and director of Tulip, a Geneva-based consulting firm, Colette advises governments and international organizations on how to leverage legal and regulatory frameworks to promote inclusive and green development. And Geraldo Vidigal, again a friend from Geneva, is an assistant professor at the University of Amsterdam, where he lectures in international trade law, public international law, and coordinates the LLM in international trade and investment law. He's co-chair of the Fair, Free, Free, Fair, and Green Governing Europe's Trade Relations in a Changing Global Economic Order Research Project of the Amsterdam System Center sorry, for European Studies and Managing Editor of Legal Issues of Economic Integration and Theme Developer for International Economic Law at Oxford International Organization. Last but not least, our only economist on the panel is Manal Shihabi, who is an Oxford-based applied economist with expertise and interests in development at the intersection of energy economists, economics, climate, and resource sustainability. She is an associate faculty member of the Faculty of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies at the University of Oxford, a founding director of SHEER, Research and Advisory, a member of the ANU's Institute for Climate, Energy and Disaster Solutions, and has served as a consultant, author, board member on a number of energy and climate related projects and initiatives. Now, if I, that description or recitation of resumes um, does not sufficiently convince you that we have a great panel and discussion in stock for you. I don't know what will. So I'll stop speaking and hand over the floor first to Atul, who will provide his thoughts on the question, and I'm sure speak about what the Indian government is doing in response to the EU CBAM. So over to you, Atul, and welcome again. Thanks, Yanvi, for the very kind introduction. So, uh... I have four slides to aid me in this slightly uh, technical topic. So uh, first, in the sense why I say what I say, uh, just a prelude to that, the position of uh, people who advocate CBAM and the position who uh, of people who oppose CBAM is so fundamentally different that I believe it is going to be a very long and expensive litigation. So litigation may not be uh, a solution to CBAM, future expansion of CBAM. That's number one. Number two, what I also believe is CBAM is not going to stop in the current form. It will lead to expansion in product scope because you can't be in a situation where steel and aluminium is expensive to make, but the car is not. So that means the, uh, the holy grail is handed over to the developing world that please make your car and export it directly to the European Union. So that can't happen. So therefore, product scope will expand in future. CBAM will also likely to lead to realignment not just direct exports to EU, but let's say aluminium and steel, which goes from Asia to other parts of Asia and Middle East, and then exported into a final product, which is also covered by CBAM. So CBAM will have an impact on the value chains, a broader value chains, rather than just the direct exports to EU. I also believe that we must first attempt to help ourselves before depending on the largies of the North. I know it's a slightly loaded statement, but I do believe that if there is a expectation that somehow CBAM funds 
which go to the EU budget will flow back to the developing countries. I think we are still living in a in a world which is probably three decades behind and we rely on those promises. So we have to help ourselves. So on this lines, we started thinking about what can be done. And the next four slides are a result of that. Why? Uh, again, what we propose, a slightly philosophical foundation of this proposal. Uh, some of the economists in India have argued that it's an another impossible trinity of achieving net zero economic growth and prudent fiscal management. It can't be done. Only, you can achieve only two out of three. So since you can only achieve two out of three, where do we create funds for decarbonization? You must have the regulatory autonomy. And at the same time, if you try to match the burden which has been put on you by CBAM, there are going to be inflationary effects because any horizontal measure which applies to, let's say, the total Indian production rather than just the exports to the European Union will have negative consequences for the economy. So with this line, what we propose is, let's say when the tax kicks in from 1st of January 2026, on all exports going out of the country, because it's a mathematical computation and there is a declaration of direct and indirect emission, the exporting countries' customs collect that levy in the exporting country and then utilize Article 9 of the CBAM regulation, which says that you are eligible for a deduction and there is no condition that the deduction has to be horizontal, but take a deduction under Article 9 of the CBAM regulation. So the obligation becomes nil in the European Union at the same time, fund remains within the country for decarbonization effort. You are not dependent on anybody's subsidies or anybody's assurances. And that's how it works. At the same time, there is a secondary link to this law, which is, I always believe better data leads to better policy. So all imports coming into the exporting country. So if let's say exporting country is India, India will collect the levy on exports to the European Union, number one. India will also ask all the importers to file a CBAM declaration into India so that we know what the neighbors are doing, what the value chains are doing, how much is the actual realignment which is going to happen. So there is no levy on imports. There is no levy on domestic sales, but there is a necessity to file the CBAM declaration so that we know what is the direct emission in our neighborhood and what is the direct emission which is happening within the country without even exporting to European Union. So that's, well, I, I've given an acronym. Of course, there will be different acronyms, but I call it carbon price adjustments on export. European Union doesn't use the word tax because of some internal reasons, the way European treaty is structured. Uh, it's a tax, it works like a tax, it works like a tax, but they don't call it a tax. So I also don't call it a tax. I call it carbon price adjustment on exports. So as far as legality of this concept is concerned, we again thought long and hard about it, that this is a tax on one country and export tax effectively on one country, whether it will be GATT compatible. Our analysis shows that what you are doing is only altering the point of levy. You're not introducing a new tax and the price remains the same. So altering of the competitive condition, that condition in Article 1 of GATT is not affected. And therefore, this levy would be GATT compatible. So that's the proposal we came up, we provided to government, and let's see how it works out. Of course, long-term effects, I talked about expansion, realignment, etc. I also want to briefly touch upon those of you who have seen the CBAM form, it asks for geolocational uh, data. So it also asks for what is your latitude, longitude, and UN location code. So, so a question which I pose, not directly relevant for today, but are we seeing emergence of a super regulator? National countries don't collect that data. National countries don't have geolocational emission data, even for these five sectors. There are some schemes which collect data from the large emitters, that is within steel, probably the top five steel companies. But European Union would have access 
to thousands and thousands of installations across the world. So what happens in trade and climate negotiations when your opponent knows more about your country than yourself? No. So how do we address that? And probably the second limb of CPA, which I talked about, that all imports coming into the country, as well as all domestic sales, must file a CBAM declaration. So at least I know what is happening within my country. How much is the emission, actual emission in my country? What should we ask? And this is probably my last slide. Uh, so we suggested a couple of things. Countries who are negotiating an FTA or countries who are part of an FTA. There should be clause prohibiting country exclusions. So, of course, there are country exclusions based on countries who are part of EU ETS. Works well, not a problem. But any other ad hoc emissions should be prohibited. As of now, it's, uh, in the sense, European Union assures everyone that they are not going to grant. But we know the politics of trade law, how it could work. A unilateral law could be amended, but an FTA cannot be. So, therefore, that should be asked, number one. There should be clause limiting sharing of the data within EU institutions. So, for instance, if a CBAM data is collected, it must be used only by the CBAM regulators or the tax department and not by climate change or the trade negotiation department. So, there must be explicit clauses to with whom EU can share this data. Clauses seeking recognition of energy taxes as deductions. So, CBAM allows you to deduct if you pay a carbon price in the home country the same article which we are trying to take advantage of. But countries follow different models. Some countries have energy taxes rather than carbon price. So how do we convert those energy taxes into a carbon price equivalent and seek a deduction? I think a lot of work is required. A lot of work is being done, but probably that's a subject matter of you know, another webinar, that how do you actually convert a tax on a liter of petroleum to a carbon price? Uh, requires a much deeper study of uh, your value chains, your local value chains. And then, of course, the clause seeking recognition of CPA as a valid deduction, because this can go into litigation. So if you decide to adopt carbon price adjustment on exports, then, uh, of course, in your bilateral negotiation, you should seek recognition of this as a valid deduction under uh, Article 9. So with this, I think I will hand over the floor to... Uh, Mustakim, I believe, and would love to hear uh, your ideas as well. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Atul. What a way to start. Um, for those of us lawyers, and you're a lawyer, so but all of these calculations that you've clearly done and machinations to, to come up with a very, what seems to be a very airtight and well-considered proposal um thanks for starting us off with that and i i know manal will probably have some comments on the any of the economics of that but i think from a legal perspective a lot there to consider and a lot there worthy of commendation i guess the politics of it is maybe something we can talk about as well in the second round but thank you for for that um initial presentation Mustakim, over to you. From the South African African perspective, what what are you, what are you seeing as responses or preferred responses to the CBAM? Shani, thanks, uh, thanks very much. I think if I had any um, doubts about the the usefulness of this discussion, I think Atul's uh, presentation really hits the nail on the head. And um, if one were to look just at the the opinions about the response, um, one of the first things that, that I would ask is, is there a common position that developing countries um, can take? And since this um, seminar deals with um, the responses of developing countries, I find it very difficult to, um, to particularly speak about one country, let's say, if it is South Africa's response or um, because, you know, South Africa is part of Africa and, and there is um, a greater response. And, and so from this perspective, I believe that um, the proper question is, yes, um, what are the implications of CBAM vis-a-vis um, -vis, um, carbon pricing? But more, more specifically, and I think it's a point that Atul already refers to, what is the impact on the greater landscape of um, international multilateral 
um, cooperation. Because um, if you look at the implementation of, of CBAM, um, no one may argue from a moral point of view that there is no obligation on countries to mitigate um, emission uh, of CFCs. But at the end of the day, um, it matters how this is implemented. And anyone who has a history with um, the developed world will understand that there is a context here. So um, I believe that looking at CBAM only um, in the context of um, climate change and carbon emissions um, would be a mistake. What is the broader landscape that we need to consider? And, and so from that point of view, um, we also understand that CBAM is part of a larger scale of mechanisms and measures that the EU is putting in place. So the EU, for example, has a, a Green Deal industrial plan. It has a Net Zero Industry Act. It has a Critical Raw Materials Act and so forth. And so from that perspective, we also have to try to assess where um, CBAM actually fits into um, the picture. Now, as a collective, as developing countries, do we all have the same interest? Um, do we, um, at least uh, from an initial point of view, um, see the implementation of CBAM as a problem? Clearly from Atul's uh, uh, presentation, it seems that there is already some buy-in from, um, from certain countries. And I think the criticism around this is that, yes, of course, this will happen because CBAM will have differential impacts on um, different countries, depending on where they are. South Africa, for example, has a, a carbon tax, uh, which has been developed. And, and so it may be that the government's point of view, and I'm not speaking on behalf of the government, would be to really look at equivalence as opposed to trying to, um, to attack the validity of the system because there is already a system in place. But I think for most African countries, given the fact that we now have a continental um, free trade agreement, most African countries do not have these systems in place. And so the question of equivalence is totally outside of, um, of that particular debate. And so from that perspective, I think it is important to understand whether or not we all come from, um, from the same um, um, uh, starting point. Also, in terms of the application of the rules as they stand, that is to say the state of um, international um, economic law, to what extent do we have the mechanisms to address uh, CBAM? Is it merely through litigation? I, I fully agree with Atul that litigation could be forever. And um, there are certain factors that we have to take into account, including, uh, for example, the scope. The scope naturally will increase over time. And, and so the, the broader question for us is, how do we take CBAM along with all the other issues that we have been um, speaking about? Now, we are just about to go into another ministerial conference. And so there's a lot of outstanding um, business that we haven't really taken care of. And CBAM combined with the massive subsidization that we see not only by the EU, but also by the United States under the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, does also um, beg some consideration in, in how we um, address this particular issue. Now, of course, insofar as CBAM seemingly also departs from this concept um, of common but differential um, responsibilities um, and respective um, capacities, um, we need to really think and understand um, how we leverage this particular situation because, of course, as I said, there are both threats and opportunities, and these threats and opportunities also relate to the policies that we want to implement in our respective national and regional jurisdictions. And so uh, from that perspective, it would be important to, um, to understand uh, through the presentations and interaction with the audience um, to what extent this would, um, this would impact the type of responses that um, that we may have, but certainly uh, enforcing uh, CBDR, for example, will be uh, an important uh, reaction. Uh, of course, 
uh, we in the WTO know it as, as special and differential treatment, but the history once again belies um, the effort here because ultimately special and differential treatment is almost dead uh, when it comes to developed members of um, the WTO. And, and so um, if we look at this, the, um, the CBAM and we ask ourselves how we try to um, mitigate uh, the particular instrument, um, it is rather difficult because we have not completed the business of the day. Uh, we have the Doha Declaration, uh, the Doha Round that has not been concluded and that is essentially um, been stalled. Um, many of the issues that are of interest to developing countries have not been addressed. And so in that context, it makes this um, contestation um, much more difficult. Now, of course, I'm not going to go into the specific economic impacts, but we do know that all countries will be impacted um, in some or other way. Uh, and it will depend, firstly, on whether or not a country buys into the methodology and the approach of CBAM. If a country does not buy into that methodology or is unable to do so, it will be affected even more. And, and of course, the, the members of the African Union stand to be affected um, um, more seriously than, um, than most countries. Uh, also, given the fact that the EU is a major trading partner, not only of, of South Africa, but also um, the African continent. And, and this, of course, uh, puts greater pressure on um, market access commitments and the, the barrier that, um, that the CBAM actually um, represents. Now, in closing, um, litigation options, um, yes, we could go into uh, justifications, we could go into um, attacking uh, the measure, but we also understand that the, the dispute settlement uh, function at the WTO has been impaired with uh, the suspension of the appellate body. And so um, that process, um, even if we go through all of the stages of consultation, establishing a panel, we may have a situation where there is an appeal um, into the void. Um, what could be interim measures would be to look at the uh, period of, of, of implementation to have a slower phasing of the CBAM based on on the various exemptions that international law offer to uh, developing countries to get an undertaking that the sectoral um, coverage of the CBAM will be limited. Um, that's not something that the European Commission has undertaken to do. Um, also, financial support uh, to address uh, climate change. So the fund is a good idea, but where the money will actually come uh, will, um, will depend uh, firstly, on uh, political will, um, and as we know, and I think Atul uh, alluded to this, we we will uh, we will delude ourselves if we think that money will uh, be given uh, at any given point in time uh, to developing countries, and and then of course, um, in so yeah. far as Mr. Kim, we have to wrap up. Okay, so in so far as uh, the risk. Uh, depends on policy exposure of countries um, and, and the, the, the exports of countries uh, to the EU. Um, it also depends on the ability of countries to reduce um, and, and to report and reduce uh, emissions. And, and so from that point of view, I believe that we need to address the unfinished um, uh, agenda in terms of Doha. We need to defend international principles such as CBDR. We need to look at finance um, for achieving the SDGs. Um, and importantly, most important, that we start to design and implement industrial policies that will make us fit for purpose. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mustakim, for that very different type of presentation. Um, I think helicoptering up again, to the broader landscape in which CBAM, the EU CBAM is being implemented and all of the considerations that are very near and dear to the hearts of those executing trade policy in a lot of the developing world. Um, so really, really another great presentation to add to the pot. Um, let's go to Colette now, who I know um, has done a lot of work, especially looking at from the EU's perspective, what they can do um, solidly 
to make the UCBA more development friendly. And I know through some work, she has also looked at the impact of CBAM on some regions and in particular, um, Africa. So Colette, over to you for your, your perspectives on this um, wide ranging discussion. Great, thank you so much, uh, Janif. And uh, apologies to the audience if I have to stop and blow my nose in the middle of the presentation because I am down with a cold. Um, but um, very interesting, first of all, listening to uh, the two previous uh, panelists. I, it's always very interesting to see different regional perspectives and some concrete ideas as well coming out uh, from Atul's presentation in particular. So that's that's very enriching and I wish we had more time to engage. Um, but as Janif just mentioned, um, I'm gonna take a slightly different approach uh, and talk a bit about uh, what the EU can also do to better integrate the development dimension in CBAM. Um, and if I have time, I'll go a little bit more also into uh, developing country perspectives and what actions can be taken generally uh, from the developing country side. Um, but basically, what I think just to start this off, um, CBAM is interesting and CBAM is, is complicated because it's at the intersection of almost two different ways of thinking and two different regimes. So on the one hand, of course, there is UNFCCC, uh, the climate commitments, and also, which has already been mentioned, the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective uh, capabilities. Um, and that suggests in part that countries can have their own set of ambitions depending on a variety of factors uh, to climate mitigation, right? Historic uh, contributions, uh, existing contributions, uh, you know, current um, economics, et cetera. Um, so the EU has taken this on and said, we're gonna have very stringent climate commitments. We're gonna actually enshrine legally in our laws uh, but through the climate law that we have net zero emissions um, by um, 2050. And as part of that, they have said, we now need the CBAM. Why? Because if all we do is having that commitment and having the emissions trading scheme in place in the EU, then we might have leakage, uh, then there might be a competitive disadvantage for the EU. Um, there will be an unequal trading field, if you will. So that gets us into trade. Um, where one of the principles is um, a level playing field in trade. And so these two elements don't quite align. And hence we have CBAM and hence it is problematic for all these different reasons that we've already heard. Um, I'm gonna talk a bit about where some options could be from the EU side to address some developing country uh, uh, considerations. So um, this is part of a framework uh, that I was part of developing together with Europe Jacques Delors, a Brussels-based think tank. Um, and basically um, the idea is that there must be a triangle framework. Uh, and that triangle framework would be one where trade, environment and development are addressed all together and not just trade and environment or trade and development, which is typically what uh, is happening uh, today. Um, and as part of that uh, triangle framework, there are three different ways in which development can be better integrated. Um, one is an improved narrative. The second one is a diversified approach. And the third one is a new panoply of instruments. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about each of those three. So with regards to the narrative, um, it's imperative that the EU integrates the justice dimension, uh, which as a central part of trade and climate leadership uh, and not just focus on climate leadership, which it has very much done so far. Um, and here it's important that there's consideration and acknowledgement of trade dependency on the EU of many developing countries, um, and thereby that within the EU leadership, there is a proactive approach that addresses this, not just a reactive approach when concerns and complaints come in, which has happened quite a bit in the context of CBAM. Um, but for that proactive approach to happen, um, what is important there on the EU side is that within the design of a measure, developing country voices are much more taken into account, not just consulted, but also listened to, um, and that what's happening in developing countries itself is also better reflected. Um, right now, of course, we have the CBAM, it's in a transitional phase, um, but the final text will not, uh, or the, the regulation will not go into effect until January, 2026. So there is a bit of scope here um, to give feedback uh, to the EU from the developing country side on what is working and what isn't very concretely, um, what, you know, for, or, and, and to ask for modifications. Um, 
So for example, um, there could be special provisions to reduce reporting frequency for small and medium enterprises from certain developing countries uh, or other technical ways in which to ease the burden of the CBAM and that it imposes uh, for developing countries. Um, there could also be modification requests in the context of default values um, and how those are calculated, um, which is one of the sticking points here. If you cannot give, uh, if you cannot report your actual embedded emissions uh, that are direct basically in your production, you go first to default values of your country, which is essentially the average of that that commodity for your country that is part of an EU database. But if those data are not there, you're gonna go to an EU default value. And the EU default value is basically an adverse inference based on um, some uh, poorly producing EU uh, um, uh, industries in that area, products in that area. So it's here, for example, really important to get the, the, the the, the capacity to get those national default values in the record, um, and there might be some uh, some engagement required there with the EU on that level, if not potentially a modification of, of some of the elements of CBAM there. So the idea is to give very specific feedback and to continue to engage in a in a conversation as the transition phase is ongoing. Now the second part, diversified approach. Um, this is basically acknowledging that one size fits all doesn't work. Um, different countries, we've heard it just now um, from Mustaqim, different countries are gonna be impacted by the CBAM in very different ways. Um, so this will require ad hoc approaches to address how a EU trading partner is going to be impacted by CBAM. Um, and there's two specific categories of countries that will need to have most attention or receive most attention in this context. Um, one would be large emerging markets, right? China, India, Brazil, et cetera. Um, why? Because of the importance that these countries also partake in climate mitigation. Um, and two would be the LDCs, the least developed countries or the small island communities, the very vulnerable countries that will be most impacted by uh, these measures because of their lack of adaptability or of finding new markets. Um, and different approaches need to be uh, adopted for those two different sets of countries. Um, they can be adopted through different fora, including the multilateral system, plurilateral approaches, um, but bilateral approaches, they offer the most room to maneuver. So there's going to be a big emphasis on, on um, complementing the unilateral CBAM with bilateral approaches to address this. Um, I know uh, in India, and Atul, I'm sure you can talk to this in more detail, but uh, in the EU, India Trade and Technology Council, on the first meeting, um, countries featured, uh, or the CBAM featured on the agenda, and countries decided to intensify their agreement to address the issue that emerging in implementation of the CBAM. So that could potentially, I would be interested in your opinion, could potentially be an interesting forum to make, for example, or to address India specific uh, challenges and opportunities of the CBAM. Um, on the LDC side, there is an interesting example of Mozambique. Um, when you look at the LDCs, the least developed countries in Africa uh, that will be impacted by CBAM right now as the scope stands, it's actually, Mozambique that stands out because the other LDCs aren't actually currently exporting the covered uh, uh, commodities under the CBAM. But Mozambique is. They have a big aluminum uh, industry, which they're exporting also to the EU. Um, and the EU here has, um, has, has pledged to support, has allocated 150 uh, um, million euros to support green growth projects in Mozambique um, with a focus on helping the country's transformation to renewable energy production and to the greening of its aluminum industry, which is currently dependent on coal imported from South Africa. Um, and when uh, scope two emissions will also cover aluminum, so the electricity, uh, for example, produced in the commodities, then this will be heavily impacted by CBAM. So by a specific project focusing on a, a tailor made to this country, to this challenge, um, they're trying to address uh, some of these issues um, and more of these uh, projects need to be seen at larger scales um, and um, to cover the challenges of other countries as well. Then third and finally, the new panoply of instruments. So as has been mentioned, I think Genevieve, you mentioned it in your introductory speech, um, there is no special exemption in the CBAM, of course, for LDCs or the minimum threshold of countries underneath a certain uh, greenhouse gas emission uh, threshold, et cetera. Um, this was discussed, however, but it didn't get through. 
um, the European Commission cautioned against it, saying that blanket, and I'm quoting, blanket exemptions from a CBAM should be avoided as setting up a mechanism that will encourage LDCs to increase their levels of emission would run counter to the overarching objectives of the CBAM. Um, so that's been discussed. It didn't get through. Um, it would, of course, be another way to integrate the development dimension better, especially, re especially when exempting those that are not responsible for uh, the greenhouse gas problem that we're seeing. Um, but that ship basically sailed at this point. Um, but what would be important instead, and we've heard it, is making sure that some CBAM revenues are allocated specifically to developing country transitions. Um, what's also important is to um, focus on, better focus on aid for trade partnerships, technology transfer. That's going to be critical with many uh, LDCs and others not having the actual technology that it requires to make the transition to the green to a green industry uh, and the cost of capital in many developing countries being so high. Um, so that is going to be really, really important. Um, and more work needs to be done on shaping what that needs to look like. And then finally, enhancing transparency, uh, predictability, dialogue. Um, very often when I talk to governments uh, in, in different developing countries on things like CBAM, they tell you, we don't know what is happening. There are so many updates every, you know, every month, every two months. We don't know where to find it. We don't know how to interpret it. We don't know what the implications are. Um, so those are some thoughts on the side of where the EU can come in. And if I have half a minute more, um, just mm -hmm. to say, I know we're, we're silent time, but just to say that that's, of course, one part of the story. And the other part of the story is very much where developing countries can come in. And here I would say that um, there's a lot of criticism and concern. We've heard it just here as well. Um, but what's important is for developing countries generally to take a very proactive approach and to, and to do a study of what industries will be impacted today, tomorrow, uh, how big that impact is going to be, what the government in that country can do to better lay us with the private sector of those industries that are impacted. And then looking at things like um, greening the grid for scope two emissions, um, especially when your grid is not uh, green right now, but also, for instance, setting up national lever verifiers so that your uh, industry can have low cost uh, to verify uh, emission uh, uh, accounting in the in, in the um, as required by the CBAM. So there's a lot that can happen. What's critical there is proactivity, also vis-a-vis -vis engagement with the EU, um, because the EU is probably not going to knock on your door and say, hey, you know, this this is what we're going to do. So it's really important for the recipient countries uh, to be proactive in that regard. And I'm going to stop here. Thanks. Thank you for those observations, um, Colette, and for laying out um, from an EU sort of perspective, what could be areas for redress. It does take the EU CBAM as a given and uh, sort of provides avenues for improving, tweaking, um, better responding to, to the challenge of, of, of you know, a, a ensuring compliance with it. And some may some may say that the very premise of, of having to do all of these things needs also to be questioned. So I'm, I'm curious to see whether there will be some engagement afterwards by the panel, but very useful and concrete suggestions of how, how to engage um, will require quite a bit of upheaval in terms of just the funding and the preparation for this new regime. And the costs associated with it need to be definitely very much upper mind, uh, upper in the minds of, of those who would, would have to comply. But really excellent uh, remarks. So thank you for that contribution. I'm gonna go now to Geraldo, um, who will provide some perspectives, I imagine, from, from the Brazilian experience, but also much more generally. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Anif. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I was uh, asked to speak uh, mostly about Brazil, but maybe I start uh, with giving uh, an overview of uh, you know who is affected by CBAM, uh, following up on what uh, Colette just said. Uh, so I would like to, to share my screen for just uh, two uh, pictures, uh, and then I'll move on to the, the let's say the three uh, tiers in which Brazil is thinking about this. Um, there you go. I'll do this now. Um, presentation here. So I think here you can see right uh, the this 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 image uh, that shows how countries are being affected by CBAM. Uh, 
uh, and here you can see really that uh, relatively speaking, Mozambique is, 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 is bottom of the list with their aluminum industry. Uh, but there are, are a number of other countries uh, uh, that are also significantly affected. Brazil, in terms of percentage of total exports, it's really uh, it's really uh, some some of iron and steel, but it's really uh, just a, you know around one percent, if that much, of total exports. Uh, whereas in terms of how of of, of monetary value, you're looking at uh, Russia, China, Turkey, uh, Ukraine being uh, the most affected. Uh, Brazil somewhat affected, but again, really uh, really small compared to the to the overall uh, exports of the country. Um, and then uh, secondly, uh, you have, what do I have? Um, okay, here. Yeah, so uh, this is uh, about the uh, potential uh, impact on output, right, by, by country. And so here again, you see Mozambique, Moldova, Serbia, uh, really, really high with significant impact on, on the total output. Um, and uh, whereas uh, Brazil is, is again, uh, doesn't even uh, appear on, on this list. So let's say for Brazil, uh, as, uh, and again, now to go back to, 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 to Musa Kim, this is more a matter of, of, of principle and of what the, the international trade system and the, the, the legal framework or you know, the, the normative framework within which we think of what is allowed and what isn't, uh, how it should work. Uh, and and the Brazil, of course, is is more affected by other types of of, of similarly uh, recent uh, measures, in particular the deforestation regulation, uh, and but also somewhat the biofuels regulation. So there's there's an idea that uh, Brazil should be uh, at the forefront of arguing for a system where uh, developed countries uh, cannot unilaterally determine. Uh, what how we get how we do uh, things like the energy transition and the uh, decarbonization of the economy. And in this regard, uh, maybe I can think of three uh, tracks within which Brazil is thinking about this. Uh, so uh, one is to challenge uh, the, the, the measures as it is, uh, the measure as it is. Uh, then the bilateral negotiations within the context of the EU Mercosur negotiations, uh, the, the agreements for the negotiations for an EU Mercosur association agreement, and in particular, the straight part. And then uh, there's also the issue of multilateral negotiations, because of course, uh, as many of you will know, at the OECD, there's now this uh, the inclusive framework, uh, the inclusive forum on carbon mitigation approach, just that is trying to 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 calculate to to find co commonly agreeable formulas to calculate uh, decarbonization. Now let me start with the the, the challenge, track, right? So how, how how is Brazil challenging this? Uh, on one thing that I think is is quite good, and I I I, I think it's it's Brazil. Let's say ha has been uh, following the what I think is an ultimately virtuous uh, WTO jurisprudence on on this kind of measures, where it sees that that there's the problem, not the trade barriers per se, but any discrimination. And so you have to uh, identify. Uh, sources of arbitrary or unjustifiable discrimination as per Article 20 of the GATT in order to say that a measure is not allowed. Um, and uh, so in that regard, there are three uh, things that Brazil is saying. Uh, so uh, one of them is, of course, that uh, this, as, as Musa Kim put it, uh, is this uh, throws out the window the common but differentiated responsibility principles, since uh, the prices for carbon are the same regardless of where the product is produced. So the EU is sort of imposing its its carbon pricing on on, on all on very differently uh, situated countries, but this let's say this has become a, a a difficult argument to maintain, especially for the countries that are, as some of you have put, uh, as, as some someone has asked in the comment section, countries like Brazil. You know, is Brazil the same as as Mozambique or Togo? Uh, so what what other things uh, can you say other than you know we are we are a developing country? So one of them is that uh, there is the, the energy mix is Brazil in Brazil is very different, and the way the EU calculates uh, it's it's uh, the the carbon carbon emissions somewhat uh, undermines the, uh, the 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 highly the high rate of renewable energy within which Brazil works. I've seen figures, uh, I've heard of figures. I'm sorry, I haven't seen the the numbers, but uh, uh, by, by 
by the Brazilian ministry that says that 80% of the energy consumed in the country is renewable because of hydroelectric dams, largely, and 50% in the case of industrial products. So that's a very uh, a much greener energy mix than that which exists in the EU. And this is not all uh, taken into account, this indirect emissions that come from how you that the energy that uh, powers your, your industry is produced is not necessarily, is not really taken into account. Uh, so it could be that uh, Brazil uh, Brazilian products would have to end up paying uh, the same as a German product that is uh, based on 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 a largely coal, uh, coal oil, gas, uh, which are objectively more uh, more more carbon intensive. Uh, the second thing uh, is that uh, the ETS directive it came came from two thousand and three, so that's the European Trading System directive. Uh, so that's that's we're talking about twenty three years. Uh, of adaptations to you to, to you producers uh, or, and who still uh, benefits significantly from uh, free allowances so they can still continue to uh, emit carbon and uh, the use proposing to close this door now whereas for foreign producers in terms of CBAM it was adopted in May 2023 and uh, CBAM will start uh, being charged in 2026. That's a transition period of, you know, in the end from October to January, less than two and a half years. So how are you giving different timelines to different countries? Again, this is, there's a precedent in the WTO jurisprudence uh, for this to be considered uh, arbitrary or unjustifiable discrimination. Uh, and finally, there isn't uh, uh, the, the way that the, the, image, the, the ETS works is that there, there are some advantages for small and medium enterprises which aren't clearly available uh, in, in, in CBAM. So here the Brazil is saying, well, you know, this is not consistent with uh, the way that this should be applied. Now, what are the, the other two tracks? And they're much briefer to explain. Uh, so in the EU Mercosur uh, agreement, now uh, what the way, the, the stage at which this is, is that uh, there has been an agreement in principle, it's 2019. And uh, since then, uh, the EU is in particular has uh, propose that in order to close the agreement, they, they would need to have a joint uh, interpretive instrument, especially with environmental commitments. Um, and uh, the, the Mercosur has proposed in its uh, last proposal to the EU to have a measure there stating that, uh, that the association agreement should be equipped with a mechanism to rebalance trade concessions uh, negotiated in the AA if these concessions are suspended or nullified as a result of domestic EU legislation. So it's saying, well, you know, the EU maybe these, uh, the, the EU can come up with a lawful carbon border measure or deforestation uh, regulation, but these will still impact our trade. Therefore, the terms of this negotiation are being changed unilaterally by the EU. I'm not sure how far that will go, but that's, that's one possibility. And they're also proposing that the EU uh, also help fund the transition, right? So, and, and there's a, yeah, there's talk and there's not much detail on, on this, but of a 12 billion euro fund uh, to be to be created as part of EU Mercosur negotiations, because, you know, when you think about it, there are, there are uh, for, to just to take uh, the, the biggest source of, of carbon emissions in Brazil, for example, is not industry, it's deforestation. Um, and deforestation is done largely by people with very little in terms of economic, alter economic alternative options. So, you know, to withdraw from them the options they have isn't necessarily going to work. They might just continue to do the same deforestation, but just sell the product elsewhere. So if you actually want to tackle the environmental problem here, you need to provide these people with, and which are 30 million people in the Amazon only, uh, with, uh, you know, with, a, with a, an alternative means of economic subsistence. Uh, so, so they, these are the arguments, and then finally, just on, a bit on these OECD negotiations. So, uh, the the OECD managed to uh, solve uh, to some extent uh, in uh, significantly similar problem the global minimum corporate tax, right? So, the idea was that you had these corporations not paying taxes anywhere, and the OECD managed to uh, reach an agreement, which now is being challenged at the UN, you know, as part of international politics. Uh, that to, to make sure that uh, corporations pay taxes somewhere. So it, in a way, it's a similar issue, right? So you had a collective action problem. Everybody would like to tax corporations more, or governments would for sure. Uh, but uh, of course, you know that uh, some other country, which shall not be named, may have 
uh, uh, lower corporate tax and therefore uh, you don't do that. And CBAM, I think, I would suspect that many governments wouldn't mind uh, taxing carbon emissions, again, uh, it's, it's to fund their, their products, but they are concerned about the uh, competitiveness implications of that for their industry. So the OECD is trying to address this issue. So I think, let's say, at, at least from the point of this Brazilian, from the viewpoint of this Brazilian government, there's agreement on the principle that we need to decarbonize the economy. Um, and the question is, I mean, maybe two questions. Uh, who is going to, you know, put the bill for this? You know, how how is it, are the costs going to be allocated? And second, who is going to make the decision on how costs are going to be allocated? And so what uh, Brazil absolutely thinks is, is, is not legitimate is for uh, developed countries to unilaterally determine uh, terms of this change. And I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Geraldo, I think you put so many of the perspectives we've heard um, into great context um, for and teeing up for a very useful discussion afterwards. The, the one entity that we hadn't heard, I mean, we'd heard about pre in previous presentations, the prospect of a case being brought or what, what would be the grounds of the challenge at a WTO dispute, um, the discussions at the bilateral level, um, and we also heard um, some self-help options. Well, what you've added here is beyond the WTO, where else, which other international organization or uh, plurilateral organization can also weigh in on this? And it begins to also increase the diversity of options that might be available in thinking of where and how developing countries responses can be um you know made made real and made and be made better understood and what are the role of these supporting organizations in bringing some sort of harmonization or in some cases some might say um making the situation even even worse for developing countries so we bring in here now the OECD and its role um and thinking again of another avenue for thinking about how this is going to play out so thank you for that um, and thank you also for raising also the specter of new measures like the deforestation initiative. And I'd also mention that there are other developed and bigger developing countries that are also thinking of putting in place uh, similar schemes um, in the US and in, uh, in Australia, uh, a lot of discussion about similar schemes that again adds to the difficulty of, of coming up with a common approach. So. Thank you for confusing the whole issue even more, but providing an even, even greater context for this discussion. Manal, um, over to you. To I, I don't know what perspective you're actually going to take. You're the economist here, um, but I also know you work closely with the Middle East countries so, and the UNFCCC, very vocal in that discussion um, over the December period. So really curious to hear what you have to add, and then we'll take some questions from the audience. Thank you. Thank you all very much. And it's great to be with you and follow this amazing discussion and, and the speakers. Um, uh, yes, I will uh, cover uh, a little bit of the economic side as well as um, more on the MENA region, the Middle East and North Africa region, exactly in the context of ENFCCC. Um, but I also want to say that a lot of the talks or the discussions that we've seen on Sweden so far have been very Eurocentric. And I think it's really important to have something that is not Eurocentric and kind of taking uh, this approach that we're having in this webinar. So uh, that's a great uh, place uh, to be. And and you're absolutely right, um, uh, Jean-Yves, as you just said at the beginning, well, right now, that there's a lot of countries who will be looking to impose similar measures like Australia. But also, uh, on the flip side, I think Atul had mentioned at the beginning is, the extent, the extent to which um, um, some uh, countries, particularly developing global south countries, would also consider or think of implementing carbon pricing in time uh, to be able to avoid uh, some of the negative impacts of CBAM. And that is a challenge by itself for various reasons, um, because it requires a lot of you know, regulatory uh, infrastructure sometimes. It requires also uh, accepting what kind of measures of carbon there would be, but also because uh, that carbon pricing would indeed uh, uh, hurt industries, but also potentially the consumers in, in the country. So there's definitely a socioeconomic implication there um, that um, is really relevant and important here. Um, so I want to focus on three main points, I think. Um, the first one is um, kind of, I think it's been kind of uh, accepted among the, the speakers here that, um, yes, there would be a negative impact on the competitiveness of exports of the global south and definitely of, of the MENA region. And, and I think this is 
definitely uh, uh, the case. Um, the, the levels would be different. Of course, we've heard that it depends on which countries are importing what industry, but also naturally on the size um, of, of that um, uh, uh, export or the export, exactly. So um, in terms of, um, of course, some developing countries export a lot more, um, but I want to give you examples now, maybe just a bit from, from the MENA region. I think that index um, that we saw a little bit ago had a few Middle Eastern countries. I was trying to look like, very uh, um, quickly and see, um, but any type of a carbon tax basically will flow into um, our countries. Basically, the transmission mechanism, if you will, will be through the price of imports, the price of exports. And because we all trade, of course, then you have terms of trades effect and exchange rates effect. So even if the level of trade doesn't happen, usually there will be an effect on also uh, uh, basically the cost of things. So there will be inflationary effects. It would also hurt uh, potential other exports or make imports more expensive. So this is always an implication of carbon tax. Um, and if, indeed, the, the, the problem, and I think this was one of the questions in the, in the um, uh, sorry, Colette, it was addressed to you, but if I could address a little bit here, um, because this is relevant, part of the, the problem is, of course, uh, where uh, or who contributed generally to all of these uh, historically to the emissions. Um, and one thing that we couldn't forget is a lot of, you know, CBAM is there to prevent carbon leakage. A lot of the imports um, that have been coming for which now CBAM will be imposed um, were also imports of multinationals from Europe or from other uh, high emitting countries. Uh, so that also, in a way, it is not intended, I think, in some instances, it's not meant to be a punishment, so to speak, to the developing country that is home to these um, uh, uh, industries, but it does have a negative effect uh, there, naturally, that we need. Um, so in the, in the event or in the context of the Middle East specifically, who will be mostly impacted? So um, it, particularly, and I think this is, was on the list of, of, um, of what we uh, saw, so in terms of the now the, the industries that were mostly impacted through you know scope one and also scope two, we're looking at aluminium, for example. Um, we're looking at places like UAE, Bahrain, uh, Egypt, Algeria. Uh, these are large uh, uh, contributors or large exporters um, of, of different industries, whether it's fertilizers or or um, or even uh, um, uh, aluminium, and these will be very much impacted. And, and and one of the ways that they might be affected by that, me, Egypt, for example, is considering looking, uh, taking some carbon pricing to mitigate that. But also, I think, I, I can't remember who, but somebody else from um, the speakers, and I apologize, I can't remember who, but there's also potential of, can we export to other uh, regions in Asia, particularly? Now, the second element would be, we often think of who are the larger emitters in MENA and the Middle East, it's the oil exporters. At this stage, this once it's going to be an extension of the CBAM to cover all scopes um, of all the um, eligible um, uh, products and the EU you know, trading uh, emissions trading system, then there, there could be then obviously potential uh, uh, impact on, on other countries. And the EU uh, has been getting a lot of diesel, for example, and gas, particularly after the Russia, uh, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine from the Middle East. Uh, but in the Middle East, generally, uh, a lot of um, its, its exports uh, go go more to Asia, to Asia uh, more so than Europe. Uh, but then there's also a third layer that I think we haven't talked about much is what's going to happen to the new potential new industries that there could be, uh, particularly uh, hydrogen, for example. We've talked a lot about hydrogen. We see a big interest in that. Where is that going to be affected? If that's going to be green, then potentially there it could be uh, not impacted by by um, a CBAM, and maybe this could be a potential uh, expediter or accelerator for uh, renewables, for example, uh, to accelerate so that, you know, to reduce the emissions content of some of the exports. So that's the first point that I kind of wanted to cover in, in the MENA context and the economics of how it, very simply, of course, of how it, and it, it goes into affecting. And the last thing I want to say on this actually is a tool said something about uh, good data means good policy, I think. Um, I think it's actually, there's a step further that's missing. It's the data by itself doesn't generate policy if the data aren't used uh, for a policy assessment. So part of the challenge I think we have in a lot of the developing countries is we don't have enough data to measure or model where or who is actually impacted uh, by CBAM. And then if we can't affect it, we can't really measure who's going to be impacted. How can we then have policies to really then better uh, address these negative uh, impacts? So I think that the, the data component is extremely 
critical. And through my work with the various developing countries and the, the UNFCCC, that has been one of the areas that we've been trying to address through various capacity buildings um, and also looking at impact of various responsible well, tax measures, for example, on a developing countries. A big problem is the lack of data. The second issue I want to mention quite quickly is there's a, a component here that I think could be a potential uh, uh, challenge is um, uh, how do you ensure uh, basically uh, fairness and in, in, in carbon assessment? So even if, if we all follow if all the products, follow uh, the Europeans way of, of, of uh, carbon accounting, if and I think Atul had, had alluded to this at the beginning, if it should be on the product, on the whole supply chain. But then to consider the whole supply chain means you're looking at things of, of other imports and other export or components, uh, potentially looking at carbon accounting from other places and other jurisdictions. And there is just no uh, uh, unified way of measuring and accounting uh, carbon globally. So that's going to be a challenge as well, which will definitely affect uh, the fairness of this process and the competitiveness of it. Um, and the last and final point I want to talk about is on the issue of a just transition um, uh, and, and climate justice and just transition is an area I've, I've been working on quite closely and, and also um, with the UNFCCC on this. And that was one of the things I covered in December that you mentioned, uh, Jean-Yves. But one of the issues here is how do we ensure that the countries that did not contribute, uh, who are developing countries at large, did not contribute to uh, climate change historically are not being penalized. And the EU had um, historically basically contributed um, I wrote this figure here about 26% of global CO2 emissions, uh, second in the world after uh, the US. So um, that is a fairness issue. It's not that they should be Mother Teresa, as the question says, it's just a, a, a responsibility. So we we ought to be in a situation where the the the, the climate, uh, the global south isn't carrying the burden of, of Europe trying to um, obviously achieve its climate and neutrality and climate solutions, knowing that also mitigation and adaptation are really important for the global south. Um, and, and there then there's a scope, which I think have been mentioned by a few of you already, of how do we ensure that some of this funding then or the, the amount that's been generated can then really be uh, supporting uh, um, uh, developing countries and their mitigation and their adaptation. And I think we need Europe uh, to also then here potentially consider excluding uh, some countries from um, from CBAM, uh, maybe funding more in um, uh, climate finance. And something that Colette said, which I fully agree with, is the uh, transfer technology, which I think is extremely important. Uh, and some of the technology, it's simply to reduce the, the carbon content of various industries um, uh, uh, to basically, and this, there's a massive gap because oftentimes um, the, the transfer of, of technology doesn't have happen naturally or well enough, but it is within uh, the Paris Agreement, um, but there's still massive gaps with that along with the finance. And that's it for me. Thank you. Another um, wonderful set of perspectives, um, again, broadening it again to the question of the just transition. Um, finally, this that was that word or term was bound to come up in some way, I'm surprised. <laughs> It was it was only mentioned last, but how do we yeah reconcile all of all of this with the need to ensure a just transition, which is being taken up more and more now in the context of UNF triple C negotiations? Listen, I think it's really hard as a moderator to kind of bring everything together. I don't think it's something that I will attempt to do. Uh, because there's so many different perspectives that have been voiced. And part of the idea behind this webinar is to provide very much that platform to hear about different regions and different perspectives on, on how we take this discussion forward. Um, I'm going to just kind of rehash some of the questions. And I realize that there have been some answers already given by our panelists. But this last one by George Holt um, provides maybe an opportunity for uh, the panelists that have not weighed in on some of the questions that were posed to kind of give some parting comments. So George asks, I would be interested to know from the panelists which multilateral forum would be most appropriate for discussing unilateral trade and climate measures, such as CBAM, the IRA as well. So more broadly, beyond just the CBAM, we're going to other measures taken unilaterally that have extraterritorial effect, like the Inflation Reduction Act of the United States. So the, the, this has been mentioned, the um, deforestation free initiative by the EU. 
So the question again here as trade experts on the relevance of the WTO, or should there be a climate forum um, discussion in COP? Um, there's a gap, George notes, that balances trade, climate, and development. And where should all of this discussion now take place? Are we moving to uh, a new forum, a new place to discuss these issues? Um, is it really still belonging in the WTO as a trade issue when it based even on these discussions here, it raises so many other concerns, developmental climate ambitions. So I think that's a really interesting place to leave the discussion. And, and just to also, Kitty has asked um, more on what the EU could do by way of funding support for third countries to adjust to CBAM and or establishing their own emission trading scheme systems for the global gateway, timelines that are responsive to third countries' needs. So I think we heard a lot about um, the, the Indian approach of the self-help approach. I don't know if there are more questions on that, but some of the questions now are, okay, let's get back to EU CBAM. What can, in addition to what Colette has outlined in terms of the allocation of funds, um, to third countries, any concrete ideas from the panel on, on how we can really assist the transition of developing countries utilizing some of these funds that will be collected? Um, let me just see if there are any other questions that have not yet been answered. I don't think so. So panelists, maybe I'll give each of you two or three minutes in the remaining time to answer any of the questions that were raised. And at the same time to round out your thoughts and then we, we will close. Thank you. I'll start at tool with you. It seems like a long time since we heard you. So uh, in an ideal world, I would have thought WTO is the most appropriate forum. But since now WTO is no different from any other international forum for lack of enforceability, I really don't know the answer. Mm -hmm. So that would be, I think, my short response. I do have a couple of comments. So. Uh, yes, uh, we have seen impact of CBAM on the exports. That number is visible, public domain, it's fine. In practically what we have found, so take example of Indian aluminium. Only a certain quantity is exported directly to the European Union. But today, as a company which I represent, we are providing CBAM declarations on almost 90% of our exports. The exports even which go to Middle East, to Southeast Asia. So therefore, the impact is much, much larger than the numbers which uh, Geraldo indicates. Oh, on Colette's point, yes, there are some flexibility. So if you, if, yes, the quarterly report is being filed by the importers. But actually, in the transitional period, you need to do computation only twice. So because you need to adapt the calendar year, so you do your computation for 2023, you do your computation for 2024. So yes, those flexibilities are built in. But as I say, it's really an ideological divide that uh, CBDR, of, of course, where do you enforce CBDR? How do you enforce CBDR is a big question. No. On, uh, let's say, climate finance or financing expectations from the EU, Kindly appreciate what is happening. So let's say an importer takes a call whether to import from a particular country based on emission, or if a tax is charged, then he may buy locally. So there would be probably some certain loss. Of course, the EU consumer pays this higher price, but effectively, or part of it, the exporter may be asked to lower the price because a tax now arises in European Union. So now there is a reverse situation where a developing country is paying for a fund in the European Union, majority of which will be used for decarbonization or innovation within Europe. So the gap which exists actually widens. So instead of me expecting financing, it is me who is doing the part financing. And probably there would be some token or a PR funding which would go into a fund to a specific project located in one country. No, so that's really which I think we should be taking an issue with. So short reaction and uh, again, I 
give the yield my time. I give the floor back. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for that, Atul. Um, really interesting perspective and real perspective. Um, and I, I found it really interesting in response to a question um from the audience of how are exporters and importers on the ground reacting to this? I found it interesting that you said um that even if the export figures show very limited exportation to the EU market, that a lot of your clients are coming looking for these export certificates. And I'm wondering, is that because the products, even if they don't immediately go to Europe, are finding their way in Europe? And what are the different steps of the value chain that now need to be accounted for and measured? Um, so it may not be a primary export market, um, but it will land there. And this is impacting at least the perception in developing countries among importers and exporters that they will ultimately be affected. And then you compound that with the possibility that there's going to be a new standard in another developed country market under CBAM, a new CBAM. And then you compound that with the fact that now you also have different types of instruments affecting not just carbon emissions in that way, but the deforestation um, linked emissions or as well, which as Geraldo was saying, actually accounts for the majority of, of Brazil's export interests. It's, it's going to be impacted by the deforestation initiative. So I guess the question is, how do we harmonize it? Where does the developing countries take this issue um, and we've gotten a lot of suggestions of where that is. I'm wondering if coming from this discussion, we can have some ideas of, of how to march collectively on this issue. But I'll, I'll stop on my soapbox. Musa came to you, and there's some really great comments in the chat and Q&A that I would invite you to also, um, those of you who are coming on, also to, 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 to cogitate on a little bit as you give your final re remarks. Musa came you. Yes, uh, thanks, uh, Geneva. It's been quite a rich discussion, and and I'm still ambivalent in terms of, you know, what the best forum is to address this. I I was never under the impression that the WTO was the the single forum, and I think if you look at um at the question of industrialization, um, developed countries have been able to industrialize using so-called dirty energy, and and so if you if you look back. There, there is a runway for them to have achieved the technological advances that they have. And so going forward, we are told, well, you have two years, you have three years uh, to reach a point where you industrialize yourself through um, clean uh, energy. But we have no technology. There is zero technology transfer. There is limited undertakings to do so. If you look at the TRIPS agreement, for example, 66.2 limits uh, technology transfer only to LDCs. And then it is not even technology transfer that we are talking about. We're talking about incentives. So um, given this fact, I, I believe that the approach should be um, uh, a, a multiple um response um, that looks at various international organizations. I believe that the UN uh, as a forum has, has not been effective in marshalling uh, the consequences of climate change. Um, and so let alone the WTO, which is really a rich man's club where we have to beg for, uh, for crumbs. So at the end of the day, I believe that uh, developing countries need to look at their own interests. Uh, the BRICS formation, for example, is a uh, is a good development. Uh, the expansion of the BRICS and a counter narrative to the type of developmental models that have been uh, put out by uh, the developed West. So countries need to really look at that. We need to look at regional um, perspectives. Africa, for example, is now um, implementing an FTA. Um, and this, once again, gives a collective voice, which should be used more constructively. Uh, I also believe that on a national level, countries should prepare themselves to engage the world. And um, carbon capturing technologies around that, um, that's important. I, I think that um, we will delude ourselves to think that we um, should not invest in the capacity, in the infrastructure uh, to do so. And of course, to, to fund that, 
we, we definitely need a contribution from countries that could develop. And so a development fund, a green fund, whatever you want to call it, um, should uh, be made available to, um, to these countries. Now, the last thing I want to say on, on Khaled's presentation, um, I believe the EU um, you know, has good intentions, but they say the road to hell is paved with good intentions. At the end of the day, uh, we have seen the, the EU presenting itself as a partner, but collectively punishing everyone by implementation of measures which it did not sufficiently consult on, did not take into account any feedback from its trade partners, and insist on very rigid timelines. South Africa is heavily affected by CBAM. 31% to 32% of our exports to the EU um, relates to vehicles. And uh, within a very short time, we have to transition to export uh, electric vehicles. Um, that may or may not happen. Um, that will destroy a big part of the industrial complex. And I think it's the same for many other developing countries. Let me leave it there. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mustakim. I think it's a great segue to you, Colette, <laughs> um, in terms of some of the, the issues and the solutions that you propose. And I think there was a question you provided an answer for, and I wonder if you can also zone in on that, which is the uh, member states represent their citizens. And this, the EU politic also needs to take that on board. And there's this question of promoting um, the interests of the EU citizens and not necessarily acting as a Mother Teresa for the world, especially for certain countries, um, when certain countries are such huge contributors to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, what any any takeaways or responses to any of these points? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Genevieve. Um, and thanks for the question as well. Um, it's uh, it's actually interesting. I've been talking about what the EU can do because I usually talk on the side of developing countries. So just to clarify, I'm, I'm not an EU apologist in any way, um, but the presentation I had focused on ways in which the EU can improve what it's doing, um, where right now the focus is very much on greening trade with development as an afterthought, like I think we kind of all agree on. Um, but the idea is what can the EU, do, the EU do from its own perspective to better integrate development as a quintessential part of policy making. So it doesn't just become, you know, what we see right now, a, a reactionary uh, uh, response, a critique, et cetera, not just on CBAM, also the European uh, uh, and deforestation uh, regulation, uh, deforestation free products regulation or the eco design for sustainable products regulation that's coming up. So the idea is what can be done from the EU side to be more proactive and to anticipate some of these uh, challenges. Um, so why, in terms of the Mother Teresa question, um, so uh, why um, why should the EU do this? So I tried to um, to uh, answer that in the in the chat um, with uh, some text directly from the EU Green Deal, where I mean I think generally there is an understanding that um, it's actually beneficial for the EU citizens to engage in development work um, from a number of different perspectives for national security reasons, for global stability reasons, for immigration reasons, uh, etc. Um, and this is also very much part and parcel of international, uh, you know, agreements and treaties and, and documents like the Sustainable Development Goals, where there's a widespread understanding that the richer nations have an obligation vis-a-vis uh, -vis the poorer nations to contribute. Um, so I think that idea of contribution uh, is pretty much something that, that is set in stone. Um, and that is also widely agreed upon, not as the EU being Mother Teresa, but having a responsibility. And that responsibility also pays off, right, um, for its own interests. So I think all of these elements come together, and especially on climate, and Manal already mentioned this, um, it's even more stark because of the EU's historic responsibilities um, for the world that we see today. But has that um, obligation under the UNFCCC framework, special but differentiated uh, responsibilities, etc., to actually help those that did not create the problem uh, to uh, uh, to transition to a green uh, industry, etc. So there is that very much again as a recognized global principle. And here, where is the self-interest for EU citizens and the EU um, uh, generally when the world warms and when we see extreme climates? Uh, events that hurts everyone, 
uh, that hurts EU citizens, that hurts people in the rest of the world and the ones in the rest of the world more so than in the EU because of, you know, adaptation capabilities. But that is a situation that the EU tries to avoid. Um, so that is a, there's a huge interest there to make sure that the emissions mitigation doesn't stay within the EU borders, but actually goes over and spills over into other countries. And part of the CBAM, uh, part of the effects as we see of the CBAM, some of you already mentioned um, some uh, carbon uh, schemes that were developed in other countries. This is exactly what the EU hoped to achieve with the CBAM, to have that multiplier effect, to be a front, a leader in a sense, to do something very ambitious and to have that rippling effect across the world. So I think that just to clarify the, the monetary sector question. Um, in terms of um, other elements, so uh, very interestingly, I think um, some of the more global forums were discussed and also the, the question just now of, or earlier from the audience, um, where shall this discussion take place and which forum? Um, there, was, um, there was an interesting piece by Ellen Betty uh, in Trade Secrets last week, which Geneva, I'm sure you've seen it because it quotes the Villar framework, um, where he actually <laughs> tried to address this question. And um, he interestingly said on, on this very question, um, Governments can't even agree on what institution in which to have the talks. The World Trade Organization is too sclerotic. The OECD is a rich country club and the UN, well, it's the UN, right? Basically pointing at the lack of effectiveness. So I think what that indicates in part is that we, we don't have a good forum right now. Um, and not just because of this, but also because, um, you know, UNCTAD, it's trade and development. The WTO, yes, we have trade and environment and we have development, but they don't come together. UNFCCC, it's environment and with a just transition element, but trade very much a bit of a sideshow. So it seems like we don't have a global institution where that triangle focus of trade, environment and development is simultaneously addressed. And so in, in some writings with Jacques Delors, um, we advocate for the establishment of a global triangle forum. Um, you know, some might say, again, a forum that's not gonna solve the problem, um, but we need to have a space where those three elements are addressed at the same time. This could happen, and I'll just wrap up in that sentence, but this could happen also within existing uh, forums. The WTO uh, has a global carbon price task force that it has established, um, and it's actually gonna meet next week with representatives of all main international organizations uh, working on CBAM and, and, and global uh, carbon pricing, like the World Bank, IMF, OECD, UNCTAD, uh, and the idea is to see what the WTO can do to develop a common framework. Um, but it could also be a joint committee meeting of the Committee on Trade and Environment and the Committee on Trade of Development and, 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 and TRIPS and have these come together to have a conversation on issues that touch upon all three or four components here. Um, and just to wrap up, um, I think this problem is not just there globally, but also within governments. Um, the CBAM is a product of DG tax suit. It's the tax authorities in the EU that came up with this. It's not the trade people, it's not the environment people, it's not the development people. So within governments, there's a huge need to better integrate different ministries with different agendas to make sure that the implications on other areas are, are mitigated and taken into account. Really great comments, um, Colette. Thanks for the response. And the, the question was, was directed to you um, in the chat, so the first one. So um, just kind of wanted to give you the opportunity to respond. But on, on your last point about intersectionality, um, not just of subject matter, but also forum. I mean, this is something that we do put forward in the VILA framework is this idea of not creating new forum necessarily, but activating the existing ones to start seeing the cross linkages within and among each other. So what's stopping at the really high multilateral level from all of the affecting um, fora meeting and having a discussion about which will take the lead and how will others support? And this transcends the, the CBAM issue and it's to all of the other issues where increasingly with the sustainability agenda, you're seeing uh, this impact in all of these different um, entities that have these agendas and no one really taking the lead in how to decide which takes, you know, forward action steps and which one defers and which one is supportive. So I think that that is all, um, you know, being really, really amplified in this discussion. And, I, and I'm hoping that some of these proposals actually um, see the light of day. I know we have 
Geraldo and Manal to conclude. And I know we still have participants who, who are, are, are still with us. So I'm gonna ask Geraldo and Manal to try to wrap it up and then we will we will close. Geraldo, any parting comments? Yeah, I mean, I'm just gonna talk about this last question about the, the validity of, of CBM or the legality under WTO law. Um, of course, uh, it's a complex issue. Well, I feel so the, the, the idea is that you can use Article 20 and general exceptions or Article 21 security exceptions. Now, the people who uh, think about security exceptions don't want to have a conversation, right? It's just, well, you should you shut down the continuous. You're trying to say, I, I'll, I can do whatever I want because there are no, uh, let's say, modulating provisions in the Article 21. Once you're in it, you can do whatever you want. Now, of course, uh, the, this doesn't work because uh, then, I mean, it's fine as long as you're the one doing it, but the, the moment someone else tries to do it, you, you very much don't want it. Every country has the same approach to thinking that their security situations are, are promoted. In terms of Article 20, then you have tools to have a conversation, right? And then what it mean, what Article 20 does is it says, well, there are some, there are a number of legitimate objectives that we have agreed uh, should be pursued and should be pursued, including by countries unilaterally, uh, pursuant to uh, some 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 conditions and and with some some guardrails. So it provides us with a language to decide, you know, what is a legitimate uh, environmental policy that affects trade and what is an illegitimate one. And and what does happen often when you try, as a well-meaning, uh, let's say, environmental activist or or, or parliamentarian, is that. You know, you, you have the allies you have, right? So you go to parliament and you arrive there with a good proposal. And of course, your allies end up being the people who will benefit commercially from it because any environmental or otherwise proposal will benefit some people and harm others. And so, you know, be, sometimes you need to, 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 to do that if you want to, to you need to, to ally with people who are not interested in the, in the virtuous aspects of your proposal in order to get it passed. Uh, and so the idea of, uh, looking at this under an Article 20 lens is that you can weed out what the discriminatory aspects are and what the un unjustifiable aspects are, and then you can end up, hopefully, with a measure that does what it says on thin, that actually uh, both pursues its uh, its uh, its stated objective and does so in a non-discriminatory way. So I think that's what the the PTO panel will be looking at. So you have to uh, look at the you know the devil in the details, and we've been talking about all of them here. That's it. Thanks, Geraldo Manal. Um, thanks very much. You're you're muted now again. Sorry, I put my thing on my uh, mouse. Um, whatever my my notebook. Um, so um, just to follow up on a couple of, of points very quickly, I um. First, maybe on the multilateral forum, I do agree with you, uh, Jean-Yves, that there's no point recreating something. And I also don't think the WTO is the right forum. Not sure what is necessarily. That said, um, I do think the G20 does provide a nice uh, a potential space uh, because it does have largest industries, uh, economies, which also are currently, not historically necessarily, but currently larger uh, emitters. Um, and I did post a link to uh, not necessarily something CBAM related, but something relating to uh, um, a policy brief uh, that we submitted to the Think 20, which is a think tank of the G20 a couple of years ago. And I was the lead author on that, where we talked specifically about uh, uh, how we can use uh, basically a governmental body within the existing organizations that the G20 can lead to also develop uh, consistent and standardized accounting uh, or emissions accounting, measuring certification and verification in a way that could be very similar to GAP. So something that's very uh, internationally determined, but implemented locally. And I think something in within that framework is I think could be also quite important here, especially the point that I mentioned uh, earlier in my earlier uh, intervention, the fact that we we do have a problem with inconsistency of, of um, uh, carbon uh, emissions. So that's the, the point on that. But I also don't have an answer, I think, at the moment. Part of the problem is the multilateralism uh, structure that we have. You can't impose things um, on different countries anyway. Um, the thing on the, on the green fund, um, there is a main challenge with that is how do you ensure that the funds, even if the, the funds are collected for, uh, from CBAM or given directly back to developing countries, how do you ensure that these are spent 
uh, in supporting of the industries um, that are actually being hurt by CBAM. So there is because developing countries also need climate finance and support for adaptation, for mitigation, for, you know, there's a great, the, the various finance uh, avenues that also have been advanced uh, in COP28, and COP20, yes, COP28. So um, if um, there, there, even though I do believe it is very important, but it's not as straightforward as just saying, all right, we're just going to get the money from here, put it back to the developing countries. There needs to be a, a, a real a process, I think, um, and, and, and uh, transparency and a real structure to ensure um, that that goes to the um, to the place where CBAM is actually hurting. Um, and uh, finally, on CBAM to the EU, um, from the EU perspective, Colette said something about um, that the intention was to encourage different countries to have, and I think it was in one of the questions, I think, from um, uh, Bethma, perhaps, if I remember, uh, encourage developing countries to have more carbon uh, pricing or carbon tax uh, domestically. While I understand that that is potentially a good answer for the climate, um, we are again looking at a at a quite a very difficult socioeconomic uh, uh, policy uh, from and industrial policy for a lot of the developing world. And again, we look back again at just transition issues and also countries that didn't necessarily contribute uh, to emissions. And they, you know, you don't want countries to be put in that position of force either. Uh, I mean, the, the uh, Mustaqim said the example from South Africa is very uh, um, uh, impacted. Egypt was an example that also is considering different measures. Uh, but it is, uh, I think we need, the answer isn't just let everybody impose domestic carbon taxes, that is not the answer because um, there are a lot of issues uh, from an economic perspective that really are very, very difficult and very challenging development issues that the, the global south is, um, is facing. Um, and then uh, one final comment, there was a question about the, about the protectionism of, of, uh, um, of these industries that are impacted by CBAM. Um, it's not just the most traded, it is indeed initially the most emitting, but with the expansion of that, there is obviously a protectionist also element to it, which we cannot ignore. And I'll leave my comments at at, 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 um, at this point. Thank you so much also for that, Manal, just on the, the Green Fund and having precision on, you know, where these funds are allocated in developing countries once they're collected. I mean, part of it is that it would be given to developing countries and they decide based on their own priorities and needs where they want to allocate it. Maybe it doesn't need to be prescribed exactly where. Um, again, the whole idea of sovereignty and deciding, just picking some of the comments that each of you is making and, and throwing it out back to you for further consideration. But listen, um, I've asked the panelists to share um, places where you can find some of their thinking that they will they can elaborate further on in an hour and even 45 minutes, I think all we've been able to do is touch on some of these issues, but in a very comprehensive and concrete way. And hopefully it's a baby step, but it's an important step in having a broader discussion from people with different perspectives, but all united in ensuring that the international <laughs> trade regime is more supportive of developing countries whether it's in response to one measure or another, but ensuring that their perspectives are also <laughs> heard and ventilated. And um, I don't also doubt that there are a lot of initiatives being um, impl implemented and led by the EU in response to some of developing countries' concerns that I know of as well, um, either at the bilateral level or uh, more multilaterally. So they have at least shown themselves to be open to discussion, which is, I think, uh, the right direction to go. But we certainly um, can promote more of these discussions in these type of fora so that the general public and academics and those of you who follow um, some of the academic thinking on this have an opportunity to air your thoughts and hear from a lot of the, the people thinking about these issues fundamentally on the ground. Um, so without further ado, let me first of all thank it's amazing diverse panel. I don't think I've had as many people with this much expertise on this topic in one space sharing um, in a spirit of collaboration their views. And I hope we can take it somehow, we can take it further and augment it. Um, and let me think, thank also the audience. Um, I 
most of you two thirds have stayed all the way until the end, although we've overshot our time. Um, let me thank also the IT persons at the University of the West Indies and the SRC assistants from Adila Lewis, who assisted me in, in, in preparing and organizing this webinar. If anyone is interested in follow-up information about this issue, please feel free to reach out to us at the SRC on our website, www.ashridathramphalcenter.com. And I also would like to place here one of the discussion uh, reports that I've been working on on some of these issues in the context of the VLAR framework um, that we have been working on as part of the Remaking Trade project that looks at this, as well as other issues that are arising in the intersectionality between trade, development, climate, um, social dimensions of sustainability, environmental dimensions of sustainability as well. And I'm putting that in the chat as well. So on behalf of the panelists and the organizers, let me thank you audience members. And we look forward um, to, actually that should be www.remakingtradeproject. Um, dot org, and we look forward to another one of these sessions uh, in the near future. Thank you all very much, and have a wonderful day. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Very much. Thank you, Janine. We will make the recordings available on the SRC website as well. So look out for us on LinkedIn. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye.